and uh, I want you to not allow anyone to distract you tonight so if you need to move around do it quickly I come to this conference tonight with a heavy burden that I've been carrying all day and I don't always carry heavy burdens because he says his burden is light but my burden is a legitimate one and those of you who are involved in worship ministry in your various churches if you are a worship leader or if you are in a musician, a band, I want the musicians to sit very close to me, please. I want every musician to listen to me tonight intently. I want to encourage those of you who are visiting from other churches and pastors who are here to take note of what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, please write on the top of your page tonight our topic, Worshiping God again say that with me worshiping God again that's our session tonight and we will continue this tomorrow evening because there's so much in this that I have received from the Lord I want to be focusing on keys to refocusing the object and subject of our worship the keys to refocusing the object and the subject of our worship. I add my welcome to all of those who have done it already, to those of you who have joined us here tonight, as well as those who are joining us by our global television network. I've already heard from some of you by telephone. Thanks for tuning in tonight. And tonight is probably the most important message that I would have spoken for a long time because it is about God. Everything is about God, but tonight we're going to talk about God in a way that you probably have not focused on Him before. The theme of this conference spilled out of my heart on the desk in my office when I sat with our worship director. And I think it was out of frustration. Frustration. Um, I was incubated spiritually in the, in the belly of worship. I started playing the piano when I was four years old. My father is here tonight. He is 80 years old and he remembered me as a little kid walking up to that big old piano in, in a store building that was in front of our house. And I would hit the keys on that piano as a little kid. And I remember hitting the piano one day, just playing with it as a child, and suddenly I knew the sound of the other key before I touched it. And when I hit that key, it was the sound that I heard before I hit it. And then I knew suddenly the sound of the other key. And I realized that something had happened in me. I discovered a gift that they called air. Air is the ability to hear sounds in music and make sense out of them before you play them. So if somebody was to hum a tune, I could walk up to the piano and play that tone back to them exactly the way they hummed it without formal training in music. That's called a gift. And so I began to embrace this gift and by the time I was seven eight years old I was playing the piano like somebody who had been trained as a teenager 13 years old I gave my life to the Lord 
as a little teenager wanting to know about God I had a lot of questions about God as a teenager and, and I surrendered my life to him by the time I was 14 years old I began to have a passion and a desire to know God so I began to read the Bible as a teenager and reading the Bible as a teenager was probably the most important thing I ever did in my life because the only way to know God is to know him and the only way to know God is to read his thoughts and the Bible I didn't realize at that time but the Bible is the mind of God on paper it's not only God's mind about you and the world and creation but it's God's mind about himself so if you want to know who God is and what he's like it's important to read the Bible I read the Bible through completely by the time I was turning 15 I remember being confused about the Bible as a teenager but I wanted to know God and I think what inspired me to read the Bible as a young teenager was my parents I saw my father and my mother always reading this book my mother is not with us today she is passed on and she died a few years ago but there's a picture of my mother that stays in my mind as a teenager and as a kid and that is she was always laying across the bed with the Bible on the bed and she was always reading I would get up in the morning to go to school and there she was reading I'd come back from school and she was reading the Bible I used to wonder when she worked she worked she had to wash clothing for 11 kids cook for them before they came home from school so she worked but every time I saw her there's this pitch in my mind about her reading the Bible and then my father was a teacher still is and he preached the gospel as an associate pastor and so he was always reading the Bible he'd be home preparing himself and I'd see this picture of my father sitting at the table reading the Bible and I'd, I grew up with this desire I said if they know God and that's how you know him then I want to know him like they know him and so I'll do what they do and I think that's a very good lesson for us parents to remember never tell a kid something that they should do if you're not doing it so my parents didn't tell us to read the Bible they read the Bible and that's what we saw And so by the time I was 15 years old I read the Bible through completely and didn't understand a lot of it but I began to learn a little bit about God and uh, and my commitment I made to myself from age 15 even to this day is to read the Bible through once every year I've been saved uh, saved we call it saved I've been uh, committed to the Lord and received his spirit for 37 years this year this makes 37 years so I've read this book 37 36 times I'm going through it again this year so this make my 37th time and I still don't understand the book but I'm understanding it better than I did before and I'm going this direction tonight because I want you to appreciate that uh, our our session tonight is dealing with worshiping God and what you think is worship is not worship you have to know God in order to worship God and you can only worship to the degree that you know someone the less you know about a person the less you can worship them and I'm going to show you that tonight in a very simple way I'm also going to show you tonight why we don't worship God most people don't worship God I too am still struggling with worshiping God because worshiping God is very very simple but yet very elusive and that is why even tonight you are struggling at a worship conference to worship God so let me begin with a simple concept the person that you know the most is the one that you normally 
have no problem appreciating. I watch the athletes on television sometime when they are interviewed by the news media after a game or something, whether it's soccer or football or basketball or tennis or whatever. And they're interviewed and they would all they would all mostly say, I want to thank my mother. They don't talk a lot about their fathers. And to understand why, and most of you in this room probably are the same way, you talk a lot about your mother or whoever was performing that motherly duty in your life. It might have been a guardian, an aunt, or maybe a grandparent, but whoever that person was that was with you the most and, and helped to nurture you the most, and the one who seemed to be always there and always available and always assisting you, that's the one that you talk about the most. And when that person dies, or if they die, or when they do die, you'll find that, that that's the hardest person to let go of. And when anyone asks you about your future, or about your achievements, or about your success, you normally refer to that person. And the reason is because your level of knowledge of that person is greater than any other person in your life. In other words, we make reference to people who have become the best known person in our lives. Good experiences, I'm thinking about. And that's because we appreciate those who have done a lot for us. Some of you, it's not your biological mother that has this position in your life. It may not even be your father. For some of you, it's somebody who decided to mentor you maybe and someone who decided to spend time and effort to train you and you begin to love that person and, and you talk about that person a lot. Matter of fact, the person who you know the most is who you talk about the most. You can always tell who has had the most contribution to your life by who you talk about the most. Can you think for a minute? So your knowledge of people determines your ease of appreciation, your praise for them, your acknowledgement of them. Let me talk then a little bit about the attraction of the means. I want to deal with this. Write this down, please. My first principle I want to focus on is the attraction of the means. Everybody say the attraction of the means. And I'm going to go in a direction that will guide you now into why we don't worship God. We think we worship God. I thought I worship God, and I still do think sometimes I worship God, and I don't worship God. Worshiping God is very difficult, and yet very simple. Write this down. There is nothing more tragic in abusing time and energy and resources than to make the means the end. I want everyone to please focus tonight and focus on the word tonight. Think about what we're talking about. I want you young people to think about it. I want you dancers to think about what I'm going to talk about. I want you to think about it. Pastors and ministers and men and business people, I want you to think about this tonight. Nothing is more dangerous than making the means the end. Because you waste time, you waste energy, and you waste resources when you make the means the end. Point number two, the greatest challenge the creator has with humanity is preoccupation 
with the means over the end. Please write this down. I repeat, the greatest challenge the Creator has with humanity, that's you, is your preoccupation and my preoccupation with the means over the end. In other words, God's problem with man is that man is always preoccupied with the means to do something rather than the end for which it is done. I believe this is why God has helped me a little bit and the little I know about purpose because purpose has to do with the end and I may tell you that that is why I struggled a lot as a young teenager I, I always wanted to know why um, I heard my father tell a story about me I didn't know that he thought that about me but my father told a story uh, a couple of weeks ago at my birthday celebration I've never heard him say that before but he said they interviewed him about me and he said Miles was always the one in the family who always to take things apart everything that came in the house he wanted to take it apart and he wanted to find out why and how it worked I didn't realize that but it is true and I'm still that way I'm the kind of person who always want to ask God not what you're doing but tell me why you're doing that and maybe that's why God has decided by his sovereign will to give me a little insight into the concept of purpose because purpose is the discovery of the reason why the end result I don't want you to miss this teaching tonight because it is so critical for you and me because we are experts at the means and we very rarely get to the end As a matter of fact maybe and I'm going to take a little presumption here but maybe 90% of what you call worship is preoccupation with the means and if we're lucky can I use the word lucky if we're lucky God might allow us of 10% of worship one day once a month or twice a year the rest of it is calisthenics we have fun in the process more than we have adoration for the God we activate the process for there's a pastor I went to visit and this is a true story uh, this guy who I went to speak for and he took me to his house and he had three cars in his garage two of them were antique cars it's a pastor I'm sorry but it was a pastor one of these cars was uh, I don't know 50 years old the other one was a little older they were very expensive cars they were immaculately clean you could eat from the engine they were spick and span every chrome item was sparkling the spark plugs were still new he had antique cars that were worth over hundred thousand dollars each he said I said what do you do with them oh nothing he says I just have them here I like antique cars he says what a pity he said you know every month I spend a few hours cleaning them to make the dust away to remove any kind of spots and you know if anyone pressures up against it you know he said, I spend hours just cleaning and making sure it's always like this and I said wow you spend hours and you never drive them he said no you don't drive antique cars he 
he said I just enjoy having them that's about how most of us are we shine up we sparkle up we but we don't necessarily use it for the purpose for which it was made I am sure that the makers the manufacturers of that car did not intend for that car to be parked as a trophy am I right what's the purpose for cars to drive them that's why having 10 cars is, doesn't make any sense even though you get the money to buy them maybe having them makes no sense to God because the purpose for a car is to drive cars not to look at cars and we spend hours cleaning buffing shining and waxing and we don't use we never get to the end so the means became more important than the end the man says I don't drive cars I just like to look at them and clean them and buff them and wax them in other words the means of the process of making them look good satisfies me I just like to look at them and say that's my car write this point down please when the means become more important than the end then purpose is aborted when your song becomes more important than the one you are singing to then the entire worship experience is aborted my heart's a little heavy but they're gonna be okay I have tasted the presence of God I know what it tastes like and when I say taste I'm talking about the experience of the genuine presence of Jehovah I'm not sure what it is I could not tell you what that presence is I couldn't describe it for you all I know is when it's not there And many times I have suffered that experience but there's not much you can say not much you can do because God cannot be bribed to show up and some of you think it's easy to correct that it's not and some of you think you know the answer to it and you don't I don't even know the answers to all of that but I know one thing if you ever get the means to become more important than the end then the entire purpose for doing the means is aborted write this down the process should take us to purpose but never become the purpose itself last word should be purpose I'm gonna say it again the process should take us to the purpose but the process must never become the purpose itself and this is not easy we and I say we I talk about me also and the millions watching me by television uh, by global network or this video whatever see DVD millions of us are worshippers of the process the process has become our purpose have you ever heard this 
Well, I paid my dues. I paid the church. I paid my dues. That's a mentality that's real in this room right now. I already been to church. You ever heard that? So I'm going to play golf now. I'm going to swim now. I'm going to have lunch now. I'm going to a party now. I'm going to watch TV now. Why? I paid my dues. So we got this idea that this process is the purpose. Whether God showed up or not is not important to us. What's important is we went through this process, whatever that process is, for a couple of hours, and so we paid him our dues, whoever him is, because we never met him, he didn't show up. But we did pay our dues. And we are happy, matter of fact, we are proud that we did sit through that for two hours. We consider that an accomplishment. I made it through the service. And the very mentality is, I survived the couple of hours, and I did this thing. Now, God, I hope you're satisfied, whoever you are. I know you didn't show up, but I did my part. So the process has become the purpose. We don't come to a meeting to meet God. We come to a meeting to have a meeting. The meeting itself has become the purpose. My heart search for thee, O Lord. My flesh yearn for the Lord in a dry and a very land where there is no water. My soul thirsts for thee, said David. When the process becomes more important than the purpose, then idolatry is created. Please write this down. When more worth is placed on the means than on the end, then the means become an idol. That pastor with that car in that garage is an idol worshiper. <laughs> he has no interest in that car fulfilling its purpose. Having the car is enough for him. Just having it is enough for him. So it has become the end in itself. Just having it is enough. So he worships this car. Everybody say worth ship. It's very important. Whatever you place more worth on becomes the idol. Even if it's a dance or a song or a drum, a guitar, or your solo. That's why I'm telling you worship is very difficult. You think it's simple. I sit here tonight and I listen to music and that's all I hear. I hear musicians play instruments, but I'm not sure who they are playing it to. And I'm not blaming anybody. I want you to understand why God has called this conference. This conference is about this message tonight. It's about worshiping God again, not worshiping the process to worship God. Write this down, please. Any other worship than God is idolatry. That's a simple statement, but a powerful one. You got to think about it for three weeks. Let me say it again. Any other worship other than God is idolatry. That can include your boyfriend, your girlfriend. It can include your spouse. It could include your very children or your single son or your only daughter who you just believe is a, a gift from the gods. It ain't funny. It may be your job or your two jobs which doesn't give you time to even worship God.
Whatever has more worth than God is an idol. That includes the song that you are singing. That includes the dance that you are dancing. It includes the instrument that you play. You could be so focused and preoccupied with how you sound, you have no time to give it to him. Don't clap, please. Because it becomes the end. Your activity that you call worship is always a means. Never the end. Write this down, please. God detests idolatry. I don't think we need to discuss this too much, do we? If you go to your computer, and I did this this morning, and type in the word idol in your Bible program and press search, there's no room on the page for the number of references you'll find in the Bible. Thousands of them. And in each page that you find idol is God's hating it. What is idolatry? Idolatry is making anything more worthy than God. Let's read a verse. Write this down, please. Psalm 78, verse 58 says, They angered the Lord with their high places. They aroused his jealousy with their idols. Now, the Bible teaches us not to to harbor jealousy as a matter of fact one of the sins that God says he hates is jealousy and yet God himself <laughs> becomes jealous only over one thing God is never jealous of anything else I've searched the scriptures and you'll never find one thing God is ever jealous of except this one thing idolatry God is never jealous about your house why it's his he ain't jealous about your looks why he gave it to you he ain't jealous of the money you got why all of it belongs to him, even the ones you thought you had everything you think could be a source of jealousy for God is poof in God's eyes nothing but this one thing what is it say it loud say it loud I'm gonna define idolatry for you because most of us are idol worship even in our worship we are idol worshipers when I say we please I'm talking about me too so don't feel like I'm preaching down at you please because it's a struggle Isaiah chapter 4 verse Isaiah 44 rather verse 9 it says all who make idols are nothing and the things they treasure are worth less God speaking God says the things you put worth on ain't worth not even less Anything that you believe is more valuable than God is an idol and it is worth less. Notice the word worth. The root word is the same word as worship. So when you say worth less, you're saying it ain't worth worshiping. Thou art worth thee to receive glory and honor and power and dominion and praise forever. For only thou is worth thee to open the scroll. This worth thing is dangerous.
Worship is determined by worth. Please write it down. Help me, Lord. You can never worship what doesn't have worth to you. So anything that becomes more worthy than anything else becomes an idol. God says, even the idols that you have put worth on are nothing. Is that why God doesn't listen to your song? Because you've made the song more important than the one it is singing about. So God doesn't even listen to your song. It is possible for you to be so preoccupied about how your prayer sound, you wonder why God never opened his ear to it. Sometimes we are more concerned about the words we use in our prayer than about who we are praying to. So he ignores the prayer. Because the activity has become more important than the goal, the subject, the object of the prayer. This is tough. Again, I come with a burden because we all struggle with this. 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. I love this verse. It says, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. That's just a, one of the shortest sentences in the Bible. It's a sentence, complete sentence. It's probably the next sentence next to Jesus wept. <laughs> Dear children, do what? Keep yourselves from idols. Say it again. Dear children, Keep yourselves from idols. Say to your neighbor, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Do what? Keep yourselves from them. How do you stay away from them? You have to keep yourself from them. In other words, they are always creeping up, creeping in, and you have to do something all the time. You got to keep watching them because they will creep in. That's why one day you'll have a great experience with God, and the next day you feel like he ain't there. Because something has become more worthy. Some of your worship experiences, like I've had, have been wonderful. And then we try to find 10 different reasons why the next one wasn't. And you got to be careful how you start blaming people, you know. Sometimes it's a temptation, you know, where you didn't sing right, or, you know, the musicians didn't have the right spirit, or, you know, this person didn't, you know, live right, or this one came with some sin, or whatever. You know, there's 10 different reasons why. Listen, if you get into that, we can find some things about you, too. Like, you came late. See, the point is, you have to keep checking, monitoring, not what you're doing, but who you're doing it to. That is tough. Because here you are trying to learn the words of the song, for example. You don't know the words of the song. So now you're so already uh, distracted, right? Because you got to concentrate on the words of the song. So you can't really sing to the one who the song is about because you don't even know the song yet. So, so you see, that's still a struggle already in the worship service. That's one thing I told my worship leader years ago. Sometimes they still don't obey me. But I told him, I said, look, and this is years ago, when I first began to train him, I said, look, there's one thing you must always do. Make sure that when you raise a song, that everyone can sing it. Because there's one thing that will attract Jehovah, is one accord. Not one chord, but one accord. In other words, everybody got to be on one page. You can't have that if some folks mumble in it, they ain't never heard the song, and then you're having a good time singing it by yourself. So you have disunity, and one thing God waits for is for all the trumpets to be one, all the tambourines to be one, all the singers to be one, and then here comes Shekinah. So you should never sing a song until everybody is either have access to the words, or they know it. And that's crazy, isn't it? I'm talking about corporate worship, okay? You know, you sing a solo, we know that that's supposed to be your personal song to God. Uh, most of the time, our solos are our performance for the people. 
So God still doesn't show up. Why do we rehearse? It's a good question to ask yourself. Maybe you need to go do some thinking about why you rehearse. There's a burden on me. You see, you could rehearse because you are more concerned about what the people think than about presenting quality to God. So now your song has still become an idol. Your performance has become your idol. Therefore, the means has taken over the end again. But you got to what? You have to keep yourself from that stuff. How you dress when you come to lead worship could become an idol. You become more concerned about your hairdo than the one who made the hair. Imagine coming late because you were more concerned about how you looked than about being on time for God. Now, that's not strange. In the book of Exodus, there's very interesting details. You got to be careful. God told the people, he said, Moses, tell the people tomorrow at 3 o'clock. I mean, God gave time, you know. I will meet them at this particular mountain, put a barricade around it, he says. Tell them come at 3 o'clock. Wash their clothing. He tell them how to wash them and everything. And where to stand and everything. I mean, God's detail. Imagine being late for an appointment to worship God. Because you were... You found something more worthy. Happens all the time. Dear children, keep yourself from idols. The curse of an idolatry is interesting. I got an idol here. Let me show you. Read this verse. Very powerful verse. Exodus 20. By, by the way, there are thousands of verses, okay? Got to read your own verses to get the rest of the context. Of thousands of verses about idols. But here's what God says about idols in this verse. Powerful. Uh, he says, you shall have no other gods before me. This is very interesting. The first commandment is a jealous commandment. You can understand why. Hallelujah. Write the word God down. Maybe we need to deal with God so you can understand why God has a problem with God. <laughs> the word God is not a name. The word God is a title. Let's write that down. It's a title. What does the title God mean? Here's what it means. First, it means self-sustaining one. Secondly, the word God means self-sufficient one. Thirdly, the word God means he who is. Fourthly, the word God means he who sustains. What a word. Every time you use the word God, you're saying that whole list of things right there. Now, read this first command again. What does it say out loud? He says, you shall give no one else credit for creating and sustaining everything. See why he starts there? He said, look, everything that exists don't give the credit to anything else. That's what that verse means. You shall have no one else identified as the source of all things. If you do that, he says, you've broken the first commandment of life. Look at the verse, verse 2, the next commandment, out loud together. You shall, come on, come together. You shall not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. In other words, 
don't you put more worth on anything I created than you put on me. And my pastor with the car. God has some problems with that man. My boyfriend said he doesn't want me to go to church anymore. So, because I love my boyfriend more than worshiping God, I will stop going to assembling of myself together and I will spend time with my boyfriend who I love. So now we have an idol in the house. That's simple. Happens all the time. I need a second job so that I could sustain my family. Watch the, the thinking now. So I will take another job. I work in the day, sleep a couple hours, go to an evening job, and then crash in the morning. I'm too tired to go to times of prayer, times of worship. I can't attend regular assembly of myself together, as the Bible says, not to neglect, because I have to sustain my family. Now, what does the word God mean? The one who sustains. Imagine abandoning your sustenance to find sustenance. We do it all the time. Look at verse 5 out loud. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous for God, punishing the children, watch this, for the sins of their fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Pause right there. Can you conceive of you hating God? Well, God says the way you prove that you hate me by, is by putting worth on anything else, including your song to me. That's a horrible word, hate. Can you conceive you hating God? Come on, we love God. He said anything that is more worthy than me. Can cause you to hate me. Do you know what is called the first commandment in the law? Come on, quote it. Jesus said it, eh? This man came to Christ and asked him a question. You know the question. He said, what is the most important commandment in the law? He just said, that's, that's, that's the easy one, he said. He says, to love the Lord. That's it. With all, in other words, you ain't got nothing left for nothing else. Your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. Ain't nothing left for no one else. He said, that's the first commandment. Don't let anything come between you and God. Even your worship of God. I say to you, friends, God says, I will curse your children if you make your car, your spouse, your job, or your song more important than me. I think we, have, we, we can confuse, and I say we, myself, we can confuse spending time together talking about God with worshiping God. We can confuse the two. Because we say, well, you know, we had... We spend time together today in singing and in dancing and in clapping and in, you know, quoting scriptures and whatever else we do. Uh, we did it because it is an end in itself. We had a good time. What a good time? We had, forget what God had. We had a good time, we say. And you're right because the process satisfied you. Or should I say you were satisfied with the process. I did my dues. May God have mercy on us all. 
Uh, let me shift this to another level. Creation versus the creator. This is the challenge. Am I helping anybody? I won't be long. I promise that we can pick up here tomorrow, so I'll stop in a few minutes. But I want you to, to get this foundation because if we don't understand this, we're going to keep worshiping worship. It's tough to spend hours trying to find God. Can't find him. David says, my soul thirst for thee. My flesh yearn for thee. Are you tired of not having God? Anybody tired? Are you, have you had enough of being in his absence presence? That's what this conference is about, Keith. Not about the songs you write and the choirs you train. It's whether the choirs are singing to him. And whether the songs are for him, not to make you famous. See, there is this balance, this little thin line. Why do you write a song? You have to ask yourself a question. There's Pharaoh. I want you to see the Egyptian Pharaoh here because we're going to talk about Pharaoh in a couple of seconds. Write this down. The creation becomes more important and when the creation becomes more important than the creator, the result is misplaced worship and the creation of idolatry. When what? The creation becomes more important than the creator. Then the worship is misplaced. Point number two here, the greatest temptation in human experience is the elevation of the distraction by and the preoccupation with the creation more than the creator. That's our greatest experience problem as humans. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me say this to you. Do not feel bad because this is not new. You know, when God told the children of Israel, Gloria, he said, I am going to take you out of Egypt and I will bless you. And I will take you to a land filled with what? Milk and honey. In other words, I'm going to give you a good life. Milk represents cattle and honey represents fruits. It can be a land with agriculture and and fantastic cattle. In those days, wealth was measured by stock. That's why we call them stocks today. Uh, stocks of cattle. He said, I'm going to make you wealthy, prosperous, and rich. Watch God now. Listen. Look at me. Look at me. Listen. He said, listen to God now. God knows. He knows the struggle. He says, now, when you become rich. In other words, why did he put this sentence in? When you become rich, he says, do not forget the Lord. Why? Because there's this battle between the creation and the creator. You prayed for God to give you a job. Then God gave you a job. You suddenly stop attending worship. You come to prayer meetings no more. You don't read the Bible anymore. You ain't got time for that. You got to go to this job. So God is saying, wait a minute, I'm going to bless you with the job. But when thou hast the job, do not forget the Lord. There's that battle, eh? That's the greatest temptation. You got yourself a new pair of shoes. And you will wear them to Rotary Club, Key Club, Kiwanis Club every other kind of club you go to a program you know a comic show but you're too busy to come to worship God in the shoes God gave you the shoes write this down please the value of all things are summed up 
by the manufacturer of the thing. The value of all things are summed up by the manufacturer of the thing. This is a very interesting statement. When I understood this, I trembled a little bit. Everything that exists, its value is in the manufacturer. In the name of Jesus. How many of you ever bought a product? I did this one time. Matter of fact, I got a couple products in my house right now and I'm going to throw them away. Very good products, but I got to throw them away because they're not working. Have you ever bought a product, an excellent product that you thought, and then when it went bad, you tried to contact the company who made it? And the, the response was that company went out of business. You ever had that problem? Very important. How did you feel? First, you felt abandoned, you felt helpless. And you were stuck with something that is worthless. That, verse, that statement again is important. The value of a thing is summed up in the manufacturer of that thing. Can I hear an amen? In other words, everything that exists is as valuable as the source that made it. If that source pulls back on that thing, it loses its value. Yes. Worthless. I think when you go to buy something that it costs very much, you should ask the question, how long has this company been in business? And how strong is this company? Why? You're about to invest a lot of money. And you don't want a company folding up on you in two years of purchase because you're stuck with a product that can't be fixed. How many of you got a computer right now that they say we don't make parts anymore? I got one. I mean, that computer is no good to me. Why? The company even folded up. I can't find the people. Somebody else is in the building. Worthless. I'm saying this for a reason. <laughs> you and I better worship God. Because if we don't worship God, whatever we worship will cease being sustained by God. And what you will end up with is a worthless idol. He says, your idols have no eyes, they cannot see. God laughed at us. He says, your idols have ears, they cannot hear. Your idols have mouth, they cannot speak. Come begin to taste them. He says, your idols have feet, they cannot walk. In other words, whatever they do, I got to make them do it. And you forget me? happens all the time it was God who sent you to college and now you're a graduate you home starting your little business and you're too busy to worship God God will pull the rug out from under you and your business he calls it a curse write this down the source is more important than the resource Say it with me. The source is more important than the resource. We should never preoccupy ourselves with the source at the expense of the resource, or the source rather. We must constantly acknowledge the source and thank the source for the resource. What I'm about to teach you in this is this. Listen carefully. This is, please listen to this. This is probably the heart of the whole teaching. Worship is not supposed to be something you struggle to do. Now, if you study, if you stay with me the next evening, you can understand what I mean. I'm telling you, friends, the reason why we don't worship and even praise God is because we don't connect the source and the resource so we what we do is we try to manipulate the source <laughs> at different times
what breaks my heart is that we have what we call cheerleaders in the church. A cheerleader is a worship leader. Breaks my heart. What do worship teams do? They've been raised up to force people to praise God. No matter how you nice, I can't put it no nicer than that. Because people come without a song, without a hymn, without a tongue, without a praise upon their lips. And Paul said, when you come, he said, before you come, in other words, there's something Paul discovered that, that generated a song before the meeting started. Oh, help me. If you come without worship or praise already on your tongue, you are an idol worshiper. If you understand, uh, by the way, let me just remind you that Asaph is considered Advanced Worship Training Institute. So if you're choking right now, maybe you need to go in the other class. I guess what I'm talking about here is, <laughs> this is graduate studies in worship or maybe post I'm saying that because I feel the struggle see the reason why and listen friends I'm telling you the reason why you are having so much difficulty even lifting your hands or singing even when the cheerleaders are trying hard to get you to do it and I can see the cheerleaders sometimes they are tired, struggling, trying to get you. They got to keep telling you, raise your hand, raise your hand, say hallelujah. You should never have to be told to say, Shh, don't clap, because you're one of them. Listen, this is advanced stuff, listen. And the reason why is because, listen, you haven't connected the source yet to the resource. Because, because when that connection takes place, you sing all the time, you praise all all the time his praise will continually be in your mouth the only way for that to happen is if you have this consciousness that everything you are have ever will have had or possess is his it cannot happen until that thing connects Praise should be a natural result of the awareness of the source of the resource that you have. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have not connected God to the dress you're wearing. That's why you don't sing. You put on the dress. Matter of fact, can you imagine? You should have been singing when you first saw the dress in the closet. It's supposed to be natural. Lord, look what you gave me. The, the sheep from which the wool came to make this dress, I'm about to put on my body, is your sheep. The thread that holds the dress together came from wool from a sheep. That is your sheep. How dare you not find God for your dress right now? See, see, if you think about it, the dress that covers you makes him worth the. And so you lift your hands and you say, Thank you for this dress. But you don't connect the two. You think your money bought that dress, your money, from your job, from your boss, from your company. 
and so you come with the dress and then the cheerleaders have to wear themselves out for 30 40 minutes trying to get you to even lift and open your hand and your mouth to give the source thanks because you don't connect the dress when you come together Paul says each one come with a hymn and a song and a spiritual song and with tongues in other words you're supposed to the parking lot supposed to be full of noise people just making their way to the door and here's the sound in the parking lot what these people are already connecting connecting the car you also didn't get this the awe that the cars made from came from the mountain that he created mm -hmm. and the oil came from the ground that made the gasoline and the rubber came from the tree that he made now you know this car ain't mine so thank you see you you don't need no one to encourage you but you got to connect that car to the source How much does your car cost, Dave? How much? I think we thank God once. That's the problem. When we get the car once, we thank God once. Every time you sit in that car, forget not his benefits. Worship. Everybody say worship. worship. Write this down. When we acknowledge the source, worship begins. Acknowledgement of the source is the beginning of worship. I just hit the punchline. I got 10 minutes left. Write this down, please. Worship begins with acknowledgement. Here. If you're going to lead advance this is granddaddy talking listen until you acknowledge you cannot worship when you acknowledge the source worship has started singing is not worship clapping is not worship see clapping supposed to be a natural behavior as a result of realizing something else is that yeah! see it's supposed to be natural from something that you discovered That's why I started this series, this session by saying, you cannot worship beyond what you know. Only what you know about God will determine how much you worship God. You cannot worship beyond your knowledge. Write it down. I don't care how deep you think you are. This is why God will allow you to go through difficulties, not to hurt you, but to keep introducing himself to you at different levels through different ways so he allows you to go through a lot of difficulty so you can have more material to worship with oh I'm getting too deep now <laughs> so when David writes a song it's not for entertainment oh I'm getting uh, beside myself read the psalms nothing but all of david's songs come out of an experience with god he said i killed that lion god gave me the ability to kill that lion so david started celebrating the sources credibility for that experience go to song great is the Lord greatly to be praised in the city of our God in the mountain of his holy name beautiful for situation the Lord of the whole earth 
is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. My Lord, his name is a strong tower. I ran into it and I was saved. Why? I was in trouble. I had to run and I experienced his name. God takes you through experiences to introduce himself to you so you could have more material to give him more worth. The bigger the situation God brings you through, the more value you put on him. I'm trying to get something out here that's why you cannot worship beyond what you know about God you can't invent things about God that it has to be an encounter oh Lord knowing you ever heard the old people say this if you knew him like I know him then you would praise him like I praise him in other words you can't praise at this level because you ain't been at this level of problems yet and they're right you cannot call God deliverer if you never needed deliverance so he's not worth that that's why you can sing a song that someone else wrote and it doesn't become worship because you are singing someone else's testimony in that book or that hymnal and it doesn't connect to you oh when that man boat fell apart and he lost his family and the waves came over him and he was saved he wrote the song amazing grace so you don't understand that you got your little your little, little thing with you. that, 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 was, that song came out of a man who lost his wife and his kids You got to lose something to sing that song. Come on, somebody. You got to lose something to say, amazing grace. I lost my house and I'm still here. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. But you ain't never lost nothing. It's just a song and it becomes a means to going through a service. Am I making sense? The value of your God is determined by your knowledge of your God you cannot worship beyond your knowledge of the God you worship that's why you can't worship idols because they can't see so you can't say the idol saw for me so I thank the idol for seeing <laughs> so you cannot really worship that's why God is angry because you are putting false value on something that doesn't perform I like what God told oh man God told Elijah he said tell them to bring all their gods <laughs> watch it now he said I want you to tell them build an altar mm. and build one for me too now and put plenty of water on mine why I'm gonna show you that their gods cannot perform have you found one thing to thank him for let me tell you something the problem with worship us is we forget his benefits I ain't no spirit in this service I don't feel annoying let me tell you the problem it ain't God who ain't there you <laughs> you forgot where he bought you from Amen. you don't understand some of you need to lift your hand right now you know what you used to be do drink smoke sleep with who you used to hang out with where you used to go you know what was wrong you know but David says bless the Lord who is he talking to himself oh my soul and do what forget not his benefits who what he, let, he did something for me. My diseases. Who what? Who crowned me with loving kindness. 
your worship has to come from your experience. We wrapped up on this here. We pick up here tomorrow night. Write this down. God demands worship. When I read this, it's amazing. God calls every man to him to worship him. God calls 6.7 billion people today to worship him only. In Exodus chapter 8, verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses, out loud please, Go to the Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may come and worship me. If you refuse to do this, Pharaoh, I will plague your whole country with frogs. Now, here's a threat from God. Now, listen to me. This is, this is heavy. Look at the word Lord. How does it look? Capital, you see that? That's the way I got it right from the scriptures. The word Lord here <laughs> means owner. Now, read the verse again and put owner in. The one who owns everything. He says, the, the owner said to Moses, go and tell Pharaoh, I own him too, right? This is what the owner says. Lord, let's pause here a minute. He said, let me tell Pharaoh, the owner of everything, including Egypt, said, I want the people to come and acknowledge where everything comes from. Are, are you listening to me? Yeah. Do you understand what I just said? It's a powerful command. He said, look, whatever they're doing in Egypt, they ain't giving me credit. <laughs> Don't you get it? He said, the problem, Pharaoh, is that you have called yourself God. And now you got these people who I already chose believing that you providing for them. You all don't understand. He said, the people, listen, how did they get in Egypt? They got in Egypt because of what? A farming? You all please listen for a go. Are you sure? Listen to me. He said, they were starving. And they went to Egypt. And I fed them. Now they think that Egypt is their source. They have forgotten me. Listen. Watch what he's going to touch. He touches everything that affects the economy. He said, Pharaoh, if you don't let them go by yourself, I am going to destroy what they think is their source. <laughs> you don't understand. So first, I'm going to send you some locusts. They will eat up all the crop. Then I'll turn the water to blood. That means nothing will grow. Then I will send flies. They're going to finish off all the rotten and the rotting crop. Then I'll send death. Kill all the boys who's supposed to be the strength of the family to plant the crop back. Are you ready to let them go now? Do you know what Pharaoh's response was at the end of the whole thing? Go. Serve your God. Pharaoh gave up. Ladies and gentlemen, whenever God calls you, He's calling you out to worship Him. What is worship? To acknowledge Him as the source. You know why God would take your job from you? <laughs> you know why God would knock you off your legs? Here you are running every day, jogging, exercising, eating right, you know, and then all of a sudden, boom, you got cancer in your breast. God said, no, you was doing fine. But I did everything right. I, you know, I took vitamins. God said, yeah, but you see, I got to remind you, you see, there's some things that you ain't acknowledging me in. 
Come on, y'all talk to me. Nothing can make you worship God faster than a hospital bed. Oh, God have mercy. You buy all the tapes, you get all the writing, you want to see, you know, uh, Jimmy Swigert or whatever every day. You want, hey, bring the TV. Want to have music. Man, worship, worship, worship. All of a sudden, you want God. God said, look, don't let me have to send flies to come and get you. <laughs> Find out now what I have done, what I am doing, and what you know I could do for you. And start thanking me now. Worship. Finally, tonight, Exodus 4.22, read it. And I told you, let my son go. He's talking to Pharaoh. He called the people his son. Let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. So I will kill your sons. Is God rough? Anything that competes with him for credibility is doomed. Huh? It's a solemn night. Worshiping God again simply means going back to acknowledging Him as the source of everything and that nothing you do for Him is more important than Him, including your worship. It's very rare that you really sang a song. We sing through songs. We don't really sing the song. Oh Lord, you are beautiful. I believe that's a tough song, song to sing if you never saw his beauty. Am I right? That's like singing about someone you never saw. So Keith Green, who wrote that song, who's dead now, was a Jew who was converted. Became a powerful Christian. I got to meet him at OYU. Powerful guy. Keith Green shared one night how he wrote that song at a concert at maybe Santa in Tulsa. And I said to myself, you can't sing that song unless you had what he had. Oh Lord, you are beautiful. We sing it, but it doesn't connect because it's just words to us. So I want you to stop for a minute and think about a place where you saw his beauty. How about when you were at the point where you were just about to fold up? And he brought in someone or something that saved you from something. And you said, what a beautiful solution. That's the beauty of God. Now you can sing that song. Oh, Lord. The doctor said there was a lump there. And then after prayer, he came back and said, I can't find it. Is that beautiful? Then you can sing, oh, Lord. You're beautiful. But it's not a song if you don't know that experience you cannot sing it to him so you simply sing it about him tomorrow we pick up here but I think it's a good place to close the meeting stand up on your feet Please don't move, please. I know that some of you are going to rush right out. Please, just for one moment, for heaven's sake, please, and for God's sake, please, and for your sake, please. Let's just do it, do it decently and in order. If you can leave, you leave together. How many of you heard the voice of God tonight? How many of you heard the voice of God tonight? Did you hear something that he said to you? Just anything. You heard it? Did he, did he rebuke you? Wow.
Auntie, cut the lights down. Just leave the TV lights on, please. Gentlemen, quickly, cut the lights off, please. I believe God made the Ark of the Covenant dark so the priest couldn't see nothing else. Let me try it again. I believe God made the holies of holy. That room was the darkest room on the earth. It was covered with badger skin, goat skin, cattle skin, all these things. It was dark. The only thing that lit that room was Shekinah glory. And that was the heart of the worship experience. Are you listening to me? Are you sure? See, when the lights are high, it tempts you to look at your neighbor next to you, people around you, eyes staring all over the place. I believe that's why God sometimes shut all the lights off in your life. Such as, you think it's dark? What he's doing is trying to become personal. Anybody ever been through a dark period? Come on where ain't nobody could help you I mean here you are laying in the hospital and the doctor says it's all through your body and we hope you make it and I don't care how much light in that room it's dark and all you can say is God you know it's very easy to worship but in order to worship listen to me this is revelation I tell you I know what I'm talking about it's from the Holy Ghost in order for you to worship you got to go backward first oh I hope you get it father help me you cannot genuinely worship God until you go back and remember his benefits see your lawyer you remember when you couldn't pay that semester the first year or the third year you had to pray that through I never forget he said, oh God I graduate now I start my practice Lord I just want to tell you thanks again you remember when you read it and now you got your own house You own your own car. Lord have mercy. You used to catch the bus. Some of y'all forgot Jitney. And God is saying, now you know something. I provided this car for you. And you're still trying to find a reason. You're telling the worship team, build me up, pump me up. And God is saying, you know, bless the Lord, O oh, your soul. Why? Forget not all. Of his benefits who heal it your diseases who satisfies your mouth with what good things I too just like you have to remember I know people get tired of me talking about Bainge town let me tell you something that's the source of my worship you don't understand I made a decision last week when I was in Trinidad I said I am going home I'm going to drive to the spot where my, our house was on South Street and I plan to do it this weekend and I'm going to look at that property where I slept on the floor and I'm going to remember the house I'm gonna sketch it I got a degree in art I'm gonna paint this house I'm gonna put this house in my present house because I don't want to forget this benefits I want to look at it every day and say God that's where you bought me from I'm gonna take my camera with me I'm gonna take a photograph of the school on top of the hill called Western Prep School I said God I'm gonna blow it up I want to remember walking up that hill with my little green pants that we washed every day I want to see that school why now I drive in Jaguar you see and you might forget you have to walk to school anybody remember any benefits look at that suit you got on you think you had it all your life 
Some of y'all waiting for me to talk to you a little bit more, hey? You need to find something. Find something. Doc, you're doc now, man. You're doc. They don't know what God brought you through. They don't understand. You got to come with that already. Otherwise, we just can sing songs. Anybody here was saved all their lives? I want you to close your eyes and visit your past and then do whatever you feel like right now. Hallelujah. Let me sit down here. Oh, I remember. Praise God, I remember. I remember. I remember. There were ten men in the Bible days They had been sick for so very long One day Jesus passed their way When he spoke, the disease will heal that day. But they all went on their merry, merry way. And only one returned and said, Lord, I got something to say. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you I just want to thank you Thank you Thank you, Lord I just want to thank you I just want to thank you There was a woman with an issue of blood She was sick, and the doctor said she wouldn't get well. One day Jesus passed away. And when she touched his hem, a disease was healed that day. And she went on a merry, merry way. But then she came to him and confessed again and said, Master, I got something to say. And she said, Thank 